Um, yeah, so I was asked to talk a little bit about peptide and protein assembly, and I appreciate it's a very diverse um, audience. So I'm really going to try and break it down, starting at the basics. So, so an overview of what I want to tell you today is very much looking at the amino acid building blocks that make up our peptides and our proteins, looking very briefly at how proteins fold and how they unfold, uh, protein structure, how you can design uh, miniature proteins, and how you can assemble larger architectures based on proteins. So when we think about biomolecules that are available to us, and we think about their, their assembly, we basically have four main groups. We've got, and they're, they're all made up of, of monomer units and how they assemble with respect to one another, uh, generally in the form of polymers. So we've got our lipids and we, we form, you know, these, for example, these bilayers are shown here. We've got carbohydrates and we get our polysaccharides from them. We've got nuclear bases, nucleotides, and you probably heard from Neef, I suspect, on uh, DNA origami and so forth with these assemblies. And then what I want to focus on today is proteins and how you use amino acid building blocks like this one shown here to generate quite complex architectures shown on the right hand side. So this is the polymer of amino acids. So proteins, one of the reasons I'm so interested in them is that they're extremely abundant um, in biology, but they also are very diverse in their structure as well as into the, in their functions. And so I just want to briefly touch upon some of the roles that proteins can play. So here's a, an example of an enzyme. This is carbonic anhydrase, and this is capable of catalyzing a chemical transformation. Um, here we've got a DNA transcription factor. So where the protein is responsible for, in essence, reading the DNA, the information that's provided there. Uh, proteins can play structural roles. This is the structure of collagen. They can be involved in binding to specific substrates. So biology can be very, very uh, specific in a way that we don't often reproduce in chemistry. And that's how we have antibodies as shown here. Um, and it can be involved in carrying molecules in our case around the body. So this is hemoglobin. So when it takes up oxygen in your lungs when you breathe and it transports it to where it's required in the muscles. And here we've got uh, it evolved in a, in, a, in a muscle contraction, so looking at actin. And last but not least, it's involved in signaling. So this is hormones like insulin. So not only are the structures very diverse, hopefully you can see from this that we've got very different types of structures, but also their functions are extremely diverse. So if we break it down to the, the basic building blocks that we're working with, the monomers that we have available to us, we've got um, our amino acids, and this is a uh, structure of alanine. And so in the case of alanine, you've got a primary amine as the N terminus, you've got a, a carboxylate as the C terminus, and then the amino acid is defined very much by the nature of this substituent here that um, is sort of projected towards you coming out of the screen. So in the case of alanine, it's a methyl group, and we have the full name, the three letter abbreviation, and the single letter abbreviation. Um, we look at the other amino acids available to us. Glycine is the only sort of achiral analog where you have two hydrogens, so there's no chirality at this alpha carbon, and it's extremely flexible, and that's really important in the structure um, that it allows you to access. If you have glycines in the structure, it's often a very flexible part of your structure. But then we have very branched, very hydrophobic side chains like valine, isoleucine, leucine, and phenylalanine. We have acidic groups and negatively charged groups of physiological pH are these carboxylates and they differ in the nature or the length of that linker that attaches the side chain or in this case the functional carboxylate to the alpha carbon of our backbone. So aspartic acid and glutamic acid. We've got neutral but polar residues. So asparagine and glutamine again like aspartic acid and glutamic acid differing merely in the length of that, um, that side chain. And then we have basic residues. So these are going to be positively charged at physiological pH. So the lysine in the arginine side chains will be protonated. We have some alcohol containing side chains, so serine or bulkier analog threonine, and then tyrosine, and sulfur containing ones such as cysteine and methionine. And then we've got sort of nitrogen rings, um, the extreme being proline. Now, this is an exception from the amino acids because rather than a primary amine, we now have a secondary amine as so we have this very strained ring, which means it's a very rigid amino acid. So like glycine is very uh, flexible, this in contrast is extremely rigid. And we've got histidine, very important for metalline coordination, and tryptophan, which is a, a natural chromophore, which is very useful in, in protein uh, design or peptide design. So we bring these monomer units together. So we take two amino acids and we perform a condensation reaction to a release of one molecule of water to generate our new peptide bonds. So we've got the, the carbonyl from one from the C terminus of one amino acid, 
and the NH from the primary amine of the other amino acids. And this is the smallest peptide we can form. So it's a tumor, it's made up of two amino acids. And in this case, we've got um, a glycine here. So we've got two hydrogens, a glycine followed by an alanine. So we call that a, a GA peptide would be its sequence. And that's different to, from the AG. So reversing the order around makes a difference because if this had been AG, we would have an alanine here. So we have a methyl group adjacent to our N terminus and we would have had hydrogens adjacent to our C terminus. So this is our shortest peptide that we can create. Um, and when we talk about peptides and proteins, we talk about different levels of structure. So we talk about a primary structure, a secondary structure, a tertiary tr structure, and in some uh, scenarios, we'll also have a, a quaternary structure. So a primary structure is really the order of your amino acids in that polymer sequence. So in that long polymer chain, what is the order? So you have an alanine next to a leucine next to a valine next to a glycine, and so on throughout your sequence, written from the N terminus uh, to the C terminus um, direction. How that structure folds locally gives us our secondary structure. So our secondary structure, the very common motifs are this alpha helix, so where you almost get this kind of like twisted helical um, domain, or what we call beta sheets, where you have uh, two strands running parallel to one another or anti-parallel, so they're running adjacent to one another. And these secondary structure um, components are really directed or achieved through uh, hydrogen bonding. So here in the alpha helix, you've got the carbon of one peptide bond and then one, two, three, bond, three peptide bonds further, you form a hydrogen bond with the NH. In the case of your beta sheet, it's forming a hydrogen bond between a peptide bond in one domain, and it could be hydrogen bonding with a residue that's maybe hundreds of amino acids away, potentially. Um, we sometimes show this in the sort of ribbon format that makes it maybe somewhat clearer that you have your helix here, and these arrows often indicate beta sheets, and here they're shown as a parallel by the direction of the arrows, but anti-parallel would be shown by the arrows pointing in opposite directions. Um, how these components fold with respect to one another gives us our tertiary structure. So this is shown here. This is a protein subunit, and you see how the alpha helices are packed with respect to one another. So that long polymer chain forms local structures and then they come together. And then last but not least, where, where possible, you might have quaternary structure where you have multiple subunits. Um, this is a structure of hemoglobin and it's how they pack with respect to one another as defined by that quaternary structure. Now, how do these proteins fold or how do proteins generally fold? Uh, and the major driving force for protein folding is the hydrophobic effect. So you have our hydrophobic side chains, such as the valines, leucines, and isoleucines, and they want to bury themselves away from the hydrophilic aqueous environment. But then other interactions that will also direct protein folding include electrostatic interactions. And we have our acidic side chains and our basic side chains. So physiological pH, they'll be negatively and positively charged so we can form favorable electrostatic interactions. We can form hydrogen bonds as well. Um, and these will also allow us to direct the protein folding. Um, given that about a third or a half of proteins contain metal ions, uh, it's not surprising that some side chains of amino acids, so cysteines or aspartic acid or histidines, these are really, really good at coordinating metal ions. And sometimes these metals act as a, almost like a focal point or, or are capable of directing the fold of a protein, performing a structural role. Um, though a weaker interaction, of course, there will be some pi pi stacking interaction possibilities given that we've got aromatic side chains but they're generally much, much weaker. And then finally, the, the final um, component in protein folding or protein structure stabilization is the formation of disulfides between uh, cysteine side chains. So forming a sulfur-sulfur bond, and this can be between amino acids that are um, very far away in the primary sequence. So residue two and residue 400 could potentially form that disulfide. And you can imagine it as being a sort of stapling of the protein uh, into a defined structure. So how do we get from our primary unfolded polymer chain to our folded structure such as this one shown here? And so there was a nice thought experiment which presumed that if you had um, a protein with N residues and you have two to the N torsion angles each which has about three stable conformations, that means you've got three to the two N, so about 10 to the N possible conformations and that's not taking into account the side chains. And if you recall some of the side chains, there would be many conformations that you could explore. But if you just take into account that, um, and say you can explore a new conformation at the rate at which bonds will rotate, then that actually means that for uh, the time it's gonna take you to um, explore all the conformations is 10 to the N over 10 to the 13. 
And for a protein that's quite small, so 100 drops of juice, this is in no way a large protein, that is going to take longer than the age of the universe. So clearly proteins do not fold by randomly exploring all of the different conformations that are possible. And so instead, what we find is that there are protein folding pathways. So in this cartoon, this would be a hypothetical scenario of, uh, of an unfolded peptide or protein, uh, ultimately ending up with the correct folder structure on the right-hand side, but that it, it manages to do so by these series of different metastable intermediate states. So there are possibly different um, pathways for proteins to follow, or they may have very distinct ones. But what you'll see is that small domains are folding um, and that they're then take the templating subsequent domains rather than us randomly exploring every possible confirmation. Oh. Let me get rid of my laser pointer in case that helps. Okay, that's better. Okay, so um, that's how protein would fold. Sometimes we're interested in unfolding our proteins on, uh, on purpose, and the way we're going to do that is to interfere with these uh, supramolecular, these non-covalent interactions that dictate or direct protein folding. And so one way to do that is to heat up our protein. And so if you, you, know, you crack an egg in the pan, you see the egg yolk, and then you see your your sort of uh, wet um, water soluble albumin protein. So you see a transparent solution with a soluble protein. And as we heat it, what we then observe is the de denaturation of that protein because we now see the formation of a uh, slightly rubbery insoluble white um, sort of matrix. And what's happening there is we're going from our water soluble protein shown here, as we heat it, it unfolds. And now the cysteines, which are indicated by these red dots, are now exposed, and you can have disulfide bond formation, so cross-linking or stapling, that rather than happening internally within that protein, uh, can now happen between different uh, protein strands, generating this, this um, network of cross-links that um, lead to this insoluble aggregates. Having said that, there is life and biology just also thrive under very, very extreme conditions. So, you know, at, for example, at these thermo um, at these vents, you'll have bacteria, extremophiles that will survive and therefore proteins that will retain their structure and function even at elevated temperatures. But the majority of proteins can be quite sensitive to heat. Um, you could use pH or salt to disrupt the electrostatic interactions that direct folding. You can use a detergent to interfere with hydrophobicity, given that the hydrophobic effect is responsible, uh, significantly responsible for protein folding. And then you could also use these chemical denaturants such as guanidinium in urea to disrupt the hydrogen bonding networks, which are important in particular for those secondary structure elements. So if we think about protein structures, why they're essential, why do we have such complex architectures? Why do we not have much smaller systems? And this is the structure of carbonic anhydrase, which is an enzyme. And you might just be able to make out in yellow there, there's an atom and that's the zinc. Um, which I'm going to come to in a moment. But what I've shown you here is um, showing it in ball and sticks form. So every single atom is shown in by a, a small ball, green being carbon, blue being nitrogen, oxygen being red, and, and the yellow is our zinc. And the sticks indicate which ones are, are bound to each other. But clearly, this is a really complicated way of, of showing our protein structure. It might be how we traditionally look at sort of chemical um, crystal structures in, in co commonly. But the active site actually contains the zinc, and that's really where the chemistry is going to happen. Um, if we, I was to show you it in this representation, you would see the backbone of your protein much more clearly, and you'd see the side chains projecting from that backbone. And this is what we call cartoon representation. And here you really see the secondary structure elements very clearly. So you'll see that there's a lot of beta sheets over here and some alpha helical domains as well. And then probably the most interesting for this particular point is looking at the space filling representation where it indicates the space taken up by the atoms and therefore whether our voids, cavities, channels and clefts. And here now we do see the zinc, we do see that yellow atom there and surrounded by some blue, which is the nitrogens of these histidines. And it turns out that the zinc is really buried in the center of your protein. So you can think of your protein as encapsulating the zinc right in the middle there. And the chemistry that happens at the zinc is that you have and this active species here, and it reacts with a carbon dioxide molecule to form bicarbonate and to regenerate the active site. And so the fact that we can see our zinc means that we have access to that. Uh, small substrates like carbon dioxide could reach that active site. And so your, your channel or your cleft is able to allow access to the site, but it can also be used to discriminate between what are appropriate substrates. So clearly a very large substrate wouldn't be able to reach it, but you could also imagine the hydrophobicity of the channel, the charge of the channel, could also be used to uh, control substrate access. Um, 
If, however, you try to reproduce the chemistry of this enzyme just by, by reproducing, in essence, this kind of complex here, so generating a small molecule model such as this shown here, you'd really struggle to reproduce the performance of the enzyme. And one of the main challenges you'd face is that these would um, deactivate, they would aggregate to form these dinuclear hydroxy bridge dimers um, because the complexes are too reactive and not stable on their own. And so by having this very complex protein architecture, one of the things you're doing is, is stabilizing what is otherwise maybe a very reactive site by burying it in the hydrophobic core. Um, so say two proteins come face to face, your zincs are still going to be 30 angstroms away from each other, which is going to be too far apart for any kind of hydroxy bridges to form. That's not the only reason though for having our protein structure. So not only does it bury and protect our zinc active site, but if we have a little look at the residues that are located in close proximity to our active site, we notice we have this um, threonine, this glutamic acid, and this histidine. And just note this is histidine position 64, glutamic acid 106, and threonine 199. So that primary amino acid sequence in that polymer, they're not located close to each other, but in space, they're brought into the right position. And these are involved in, in essence, shuttling a hydrogen away from the active site to generate the active species, and also in positioning, in this case, our carbon dioxide substrate adjacent to the site to facilitate this nucleophilic attack. So second coordination to residues, residues that are located close in space, the protein is able to perfectly align them, position them to facilitate, in this case, in this case um, the catalysis. So they play really, really important roles in promoting, uh, in this case, a particular reaction, but also can equally be important in disfavoring um, other processes that could happen at that site. So I want to use a second example to illustrate, in, in many ways, the same kind of points, which is to look at hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is what we use in our blood to transport oxygen from our lungs to the muscles where it's needed. And it's this, this protein with four subunits shown here. So each subunit is shown in a different color. And each subunit has a cofactor, an iron porphyrin bound, and these are shown in stick form there, there, and there. So it's this iron heme. Um, and each one of these hemes will bind one molecule of oxygen. So a fully oxygenated hemoglobin has four oxygens bound and will transport that from the lungs to the muscles. So a space filling representation, at least from this angle, shows that you can see two of those hemes. And if you were to rotate it around, you'd see the other two. So what happens at the active site? So again, we can almost to some extent, ignore a lot of the protein architecture. And if we zoom in, we find that if we take a sort of side on view of the heme, so I've just shown it like so, but if you now look side on view, actually what you find is that the iron is located below the heme, uh, bound to this histidine that kind of anchors it to our protein, so to this alpha helix. And then we have this important residue located above the plane of the porphyrin ring. And this is a, a histidine called the distal histidine. So it's an example of one of those second coordination sphere ligands. And as so oxygen binds, um, we, we bind it like so. We have the iron now pulled into the plane of the porphyrin, bound to the oxygen uh, in this bent fashion and forms a stabilizing hydrogen bond. And so the distal histidine uh, promotes or enhances the affinity for the correct substrate, which is pardon me, the dioxygen, um, but actually has a slightly um, disfavors slightly the binding of carbon monoxide, which is a poison. So it still unfortunately binds carbon monoxide, but it would bind much more tightly if it wasn't for the presence of this distal histidine. Now, the other thing is that um, when we think about how this behaves, we have four oxygens that can bind to hemoglobin. And it turns out that the fourth oxygen binds significantly more tightly than the first one that bound. So the first oxygen binds, the second oxygen has a higher affinity, the third has a higher affinity, and the fourth it binds 300 to more time 300 times more tightly than that first one. And the reason is because of this iron moving into the plane of the porphyrin ring. So as oxygen binds to the first iron, it moves into the plane of the porphyrin ring. The histidine, the proximal histidine comes with it and it drags this alpha helix with it. So our protein subunit has a structural change, okay? And then that structural change, because it's, it's bound to, it's got a quaternary structure with four subunits, each one of those is slightly different. They now have a higher affinity. The next subunit has a structural change. Everything changes again, structure. And each time you enhance the affinity, and this is called cooperative binding. And that's why hemoglobin is, is good at what it does. In fact, if you were to take a crystal of hemoglobin with no oxygen bound, and then it expose it to oxygen, the crystal is most likely to shatter because of that actual motion at the molecular level. So what happens when 
there's a problem with a protein fold or a protein structure. Well, that's when we often do experience various diseases and one of them is sickle cell anemia if we're thinking about hemoglobin. So healthy blood cells look as shown and sickle cells as shown here are the result of a um, change in the primary amino acid sequence. So a glutamic acid at position six has been mutated to a valine. And so we go from a polar residue to a hydrophobic residue. Now a polar residue will like to be in water, so it's happy to be on the surface of the protein, whereas our hydrophobic residue will want to be buried in a hydrophobic environment. And so how that is achieved here is that multiple protein units come together and at their interface, they bury this valine residue. And so rather than getting this nice water soluble protein, you get sort of um, fibers and um, you, you in essence turn off efficiency of oxygen binding, which is why the symptoms are associated with, with um, oxygen deficiency. So yeah, you go from a soluble protein to extended fibers. So then the question remains, well, clearly protein structures are quite complex. There are different elements of structure there and they can, they're very good at functioning. Biology has evolved um, a diverse range of protein structures and with a, a wide range of different functions. But what else can we do with protein structures? Can we take advantage of what biology has successfully evolved to do or, or the functions it's achieved? Um, do we also need all of the protein or are aspects of the protein um, maybe the result of evolutionary baggage? So maybe historically this whole domain was important, but it's no longer needed, but biology has just retained it. Or could it be that it's got a different function that we're not necessarily interested in? We only want to tap into one particular function. So can we start to think about minimalist proteins where we borrow aspects of the protein to reproduce a particular um, thing that biology has done quite well? And so it's about thinking about developing a toolbox. So you could think about picking and um, choosing your favorite bits of protein function, stick them into the toolbox and then sticking them together in using sort of Lego approach to generate new assemblies. So I want to illustrate that point here with this DNA binding transcription factor. So above in this, this these kind of blocks is illustrated our primary sequence of a DNA binding transcription factor. And it transpires that, and, and the structure shown is that only say about 20% of that, which is called the BTIP domain, is required if you want to sequencely selectively bind to this particular DNA sequence. Okay, so 80% of that is not actually important if you just want to sequence selectively bind to a particular DNA sequence. And if we break it down further, we can find that actually maybe only about 5% of that protein is actually responsible for the sequence selectivity. So actually forming direct contact with the DNA. And in fact, the blue domain is what we call the zip domain, the zipper, and this is responsible for dimerizing the two strands together. So if we're starting to pick and choose or, or take the segments that we're interested in, you could imagine if it's only responsible for dimerization, that we could chemically link the two basic regions together, these two pink domains, to retain sequence selective binding, but introducing not only a mechanism by which we dimerize the two domains, but also some functionality that can be then tapped into. So that could include um, say a ferrocy, which could be an electrochemical sensor. It could be um, chromophores that are uh, responsive to a particular wavelength of light, or it could be um, responsive to a particular substrate, as shown there. So this was for methylene coordination. So that's one thing is where we actually take the um, or segments of a native protein and we borrow components and, and generate sort of hybrids with chemistry. But another approach is to do what we call um, a de novo design, which is where you design a peptide or a protein from, from first principles. So you come up with a sequence that you have designed that will predictably give you a well-defined secondary, tertiary, and potentially an and quaternary structure. So you might say that you want some alpha helical segments, you might want some beta sheets, and in principle, you can come up with a new protein structure. This is called top seven uh, that you can design that isn't already present in biology. So what I'm showing you here is um, a coiled coil. So this is a parallel three-stranded homotrimer. So we design a, a peptide sequence, and then three of this sequence forms a helix, and three of these come together in a parallel fashion, and they supercoil around one another to give you this coiled coil. And you can design them so that the helices go anti-parallel with respect to one another. Uh, we're not limited to three. We can have two strands. Uh, this is a six-stranded coil coil developed by Deck Wilson's group. And they don't all have to be the same peptides. You can have hetero assemblies where, for example, you have two different peptides that contribute to that overall assembly. 
We can make helical bundles. So rather than distinct helices coming together, we can have uh, helices and then loops and then helices. So this is maybe more uh, similar to a native protein. And then the structure that I just showed you, which also introduces both alpha helices, but also beta sheets in the design, you can have mixed secondary structure elements. The majority of designs do tend to focus on these um, purely alpha helical designs because they are easier to design predictably at the moment. Um, but this is top seven, which was, as I said, the first truly artificial protein to be designed de novo. So how would we go about designing a coil coil? Well, we, we use something called the heptad repeat approach. So this is a 30 amino acid peptide primary sequence. And then we have this repeating unit of seven residues, this heptad. And we often talk about the heptad repeat as being positions A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, from the alpha helix, the amino acids we have available, sorry, um, some of them have more of a propensity to form an alpha helix than others. So we make sure that we populate our sequence with residues that like to form an alpha helix. So alanine has a very high propensity to form an alpha helix. Uh, and so do leucines, methionines, lysines, glutamines, and glutamic acids. What you don't want to introduce are glycines or prolines. You'll notice that I've got glycines at the end of the sequence, and that's what almost terminate the alpha helix um, uh, to sort of finish it off. So a heptad is chosen because it approximately defines uh, two terms of an alpha helix. You have 3.6 residues per turn, so not quite, but almost two terms of a helix. And so when we form our alpha helix, you see that residues that are in the first position of a heptad, so an A position, are almost directly above the A position of the subsequent heptad. And so actually you find that the residues in A and D positions appear on one face of the alpha helix. Um, and these are the res positions that we tend to populate with hydrophobic residues. So I for isoleucine, it's a hydrophobic residue. And so we generate a hydrophobic face, a hydrophilic face, and then as you will recall, if protein folding is, is dictated primarily by the hydrophobic effect, then what we can generate is um, a hydrophobic core and bury that away from the solvent. So if we take a, a sort of a top-down view of a helical wheel diagram of a three-stranded core coil, then what we find is that these A and D positions, these isoleucines, they are buried in what we call the hydrophobic core of that core coil. We have alanines that will help form uh, or induce our alpha helix, but important, we also form salt bridges between acidic glutamic acids and basic lysines in these E and G positions at those helical interfaces. And then last but not least, we have this sort of water solubilizing exterior uh, external glutamine residue. Now, because uh, seven residues isn't exactly two turns of a helix, we actually find that the hydrophobic face migrates around the helix. And the way that it can therefore be buried effectively in the core is if you get supercoiling of your, of your helices. So rather than them aligning completely parallel, uh, we get supercoiling. Um, and so if you're interested in uh, controlling how many helices are part of your design, then you want to be able to um, uh, use both positive design as well as negative design. So positive design is to favor a particular oligomeric state and negative design would be to disfavor um, another oligomeric state. So primarily um, the oligomeric state of a core coil is directed or determined by the packing of hydrophobic uh, side chains. And so some sort of rules of thumb are shown here that if the A position is an isoleucine and the D is a leucine, you're most likely to get a dimer. If they're the same, so both isoleucine or both leucine, it's most likely to form a trimer. And if you swap it around, it's more likely to form a tetramer, just due to packing. But of course, these are guidelines. So for example, if you were to put an asparagine in an A site, you're going to get a dimer because your asparagine is going to want to direct towards the solvent. But in a D site, it can be accommodated in the trimer. Uh, it can form a sort of hydrogen bonding network, in which case um, you can stabilize the trimer. And if you put a lysine into one of these A and D positions, in most structures, you're going to destabilize the higher oligomeric states because the lysine is going to want to project into the solvent and that's best achieved in a dimer. So what you put on the inside will have a huge impact on the oligomeric state. So if you think about the coil coils that are present in biology, um, and you can do a search of the protein data bank, and this was done by Deck Wolfson's group, you find that about 70%, by far the large majority of two-stranded coil coils the three stranded, and then it drops off quite rapidly. And at the time, there was no known six stranded coil coil. So they set about trying to design a six stranded coil coil from scratch. Uh, 
And this is the sequence they, they chose to use in this design. Because if we look at the, heli the helical wheel of the, the helix, what you find now is that rather than just hydrophobic phase using the A and D position, they've extended the hydrophobic phase to encompass this E position as well, and therefore moved the, the salt bridge positions, the acidic and basic groups, to the G and the B position as shown. So if we compare it to, um, say, a tetramer helix, you would see your, your hydrophobic phase would be this A and D positions, and your salt bridges would form here. We've now shifted that along, extended the hydrophobic phase. And therefore, if you now position this into a hexamer type design, you find that your hydrophobic phase is encompassed in this hexamer, and your salt bridges also line up nicely if you have six strands that contribute to that, that fold. We now have an opportunity to start thinking about channels and cavities in the center of these structures. So within a two-stranded cold coil, it's very tightly packed, generally also three-stranded. But as you start to get to these larger oligomeric states, you start to have channels that you might be able to functionalize. Now, if we want to generate a heterocold coil, so two different strands, then uh, we need to um, change our design principles. Because here, what we have shown is the fact that you form salt bridges between the glutamate on the E position of one helix and the lysine on the G position of another one of those helices and that mirrors on both sides. So if you want to form a heterocold coil, one strategy is that you actually make a peptide that has acidic residues in both the E and G position so it can't satisfy itself. And it can only be satisfied by a complementary sequence that has the basic lysines in those E and G positions and that should lead to our heterocold coil. Uh, and hetero called coils aren't just too stranded, you can, you can apply that um, to these hexamers as well. So what about anti-parallel called coils? You can adopt a very similar strategy. So um, you can have half of your helix being negative to be charged, so all these acidic groups. The other half could be uh, basic, so, so lots of positively charged lysines or arginines. And again, to align those uh, and to satisfy those electrostatic interactions, that's best achieved in an anti-parallel fashion. So what are the tools available to people? So the, the best tool out there really is Rosetta. And this was developed by David Baker's group in the States. So it's free to use, and it's really capable of designing or predicting protein structure um, for unknown proteins, but also designing um, completely artificial proteins from scratch. Um, they've even developed this online protein folding game called Foldit, which is really brilliant because it allows citizen scientists to contribute to artificial protein design. So this paper, uh, which is now a couple of years ago, um, was where citizen scientists, citizen scientists were designing completely new architectures that biology wasn't using. Um, there are databases you can tap into. CC Plus is a database which allows you to look at, in essence, like a periodic table of the cold coils. And there are also databases where people are starting to, um, to, to uh, store well-characterized protein fragments that you could then use in this sort of Lego block type building approach uh, to generate new assemblies. So we talked about how you can design miniature proteins or in particular the coiled coils, but really the, the goal is not just to design new structure, it's to design new function. And there's been a lot of interest in mimicking uh, what biology can do. So here's a structure of an artificial model of carbonic anhydrase, so a model of an enzyme, a, a catalytically competent model. This is a model of hemoglobin, so it mimics reversible binding of oxygen in response to changes in oxygen partial pressure. Here we've got um, a dinuclear iron site that is again an artificial metal enzyme, and again another example of an artificial metal enzyme. And so these are beautiful examples where we can demonstrate that we must understand the chemistry of the site because we can reproduce it in these artificial miniature protein folds, where sometimes the protein scaffold in no way resembles the native protein folds. So carbonic anhydrase is a lot of alpha, um, has a lot of beta sheets, whereas this has been generated within an alpha helical scaffold. So clearly the protein structure itself is sometimes not essential. Aspects of what it allows you to achieve are, so burying something in a hydrophobic core and ideally things like second coordination sphere residues, but the intrinsic protein structure may not in all cases be essential to achieve function. But this is where we're trying to recreate existing function. And, and though that's um, very nice and sophisticated and, and a nice achievement, what clearly protein design is going to, is capable of doing and, and I think should be doing is establishing systems that have new functionality, functions that biology has not evolved. Because inevitably, though we can make a model, a functional model of carbonic anhydrase, biology has evolved carbonic anhydrase to be pretty good at what it's done. It's had a few years head start on this, 
And so even if we get it to be as good as, you know, is there really an advantage to that? Um, and there will be some scenarios where that applies, but, but what's really exciting is the opportunity to uh, design new functions. And so, for example, here's some work looking at generating um, metallocord coils that could be explored as MRI contrast agents. Here is where they use uh, a non-biological cofactor combined to this helical di-ion site to, for photo-induced hydrogen production. Here we've got a artificial protein that was designed to have a high affinity for urinal, uh, so it's proposed to be used for sequest uh, sequestration of uranium, in essence, from water, because urinal is the form in which it will be present in the majority of uh, aqueous samples. And uh, last but not least, if we think about catalysis and enzymes, what about where we can start to introduce late transition metals such as rhodium? This is the work of Zachary Ball, and that would allow us to tap into chemical transformations that biology hasn't uh, generally explored. So um, what about peptide and protein assembly? Can we move on to not just new functional metalloproteins or enzymes, but can we generate larger architectures and assemblies? So DNA origami, as you will have heard, is really fantastic at what it does. It's very predictable. It uses four monomers that are complementary. So we have a very clear, you know, GC um, uh, assign is assigned with one another and interacts with hydrogen bonding. And so it's very, very advanced. In contact, a contrast, peptide or protein assembly is much less advanced. It's very complex because we tend to have about 20 monomer units. So we have 20 sort of commonly um, coded for amino acids. Of course, we can introduce more than 20 amino acids, but we already have 20 to work with, and they don't just use hydrogen bonding, they use a range of different interactions, be that electrostatics, pi pi stacking, dative bonding. And so it's less predictable currently, but given the diversity of protein structures that are out there, because of the diversity of these monomer building blocks, it's likely that if we can crack it, if we can tap into this, we should be able to offer different opportunities than what DNA origami can offer. So just a couple of examples of what people have done. Here you see half of a cold coil peptide on a gold nanoparticle and the other half on a separate gold nanoparticle. So to satisfy a cold coil assembly that um, in essence can be used to control the positioning of these gold nanoparticles. Um, similar idea, but taking a three-stranded cold coil and then taking a two-stranded heterodimer, chemically linking a green peptide to a red and a green peptide to a blue, means as your three-stranded cold coil assembles, it, the remain, it's sort of decorated now that's exterior by half of a heterodimer. So when that now satisfies, we form this sort of hexagon network. And it turns out that rather than just being this extensive plane, they actually are thought to form uh, cages where they now sort of encapsulate and complete themselves in this sort of sphere. You'll have seen tetrahedrons being formed by DNA very, very sophisticatedly, but it's also possible with peptides and proteins. So here is a long protein sequence which contains different um, coil coil domains that are designed to be parallel or anti-parallel and their correct alignment leads to the formation of this tetrahedron. Uh, and these were some images reported at the time, so AFM and TEM images of those tetrahedrons. And then when we think about coil coil assembly, we've always shown where they align perfectly, but what if they uh, have ends that protrude beyond the coil coil? These sticky ends can allow us to form fibers to where we extend the network linearly um, in one direction, one of those directions. So if we go to the, the, the different oligomeric states that we, all, we previously talked about, so the two stranded call call all the way up to the four, five, six, in fact, no, sorry, seven stranded call call here, you see as you start to get to these larger oligomeric states, you get these cavities of a defined size, and these can be functionalized. But if we also were to decorate the top and bottom of our call coils, you could imagine now gluing these together to form these nanotubes. And so here's a TA Im TEM image, and here a model of these nanotubes. Um, by controlling protein fragments and how they uh, assemble with respect to one another, it is possible to start to do protein calligraphy, where you reproduce um, well, calligraphy, basically. But you can also think about things like bioreactors. So if you take a, a tube, so using protein structures that allow you to tap into tubular networks, uh, in essence, have enzymes that you integrate uh, along the way, uh, complementary ones. So if you think about flow, input, enzymatic, different uh, reactions occurring, and then output at the other end, you can have a, a bioreactor that way. And then again, if you go back to your toolbox and if you've populated that with all your favorite bits of different proteins, you can have um, a cargo compartment, you can have a motor, you could have a propeller, and you could gener generate this nano robot shown here. So what are the future challenges and opportunities, or as I see it? So first of all, I think 
Barge is very conservative. Given that it has got these 20 building blocks, it could make a far larger number of protein architectures that it isn't doing. It's actually only tapping into a very, very narrow uh, range of structures that are possible. So we can move beyond that. Um, we have these 20 building blocks. It gives us a lot of diversity, but of, of course, we could. there's nothing stopping us having 200 building blocks or, or 2,000 building blocks. And imagine what function we could tap into, what structures we could tap into with those. We've already seen that people are interested in making enzymes. Your catalysts are absolutely fundamental to day-to-day -day life. And so enzymes that are capable of performing chemistries that are of interest to us for industry or for medchem, but that are beyond the repertoire of biology are certainly of interest. As, we, as I touched upon, you know, proteins that have functions that biology has had no evolutionary pressures to evolve, you know, whether that's an MRI contrast agent or whether we think about um, actually tapping into things biology does do, which is energy storage and, and transduction as well. Um, and then what about hybrids? We talk about these, these biological components in isolation, you know, DNA, carbohydrates, lipids and, and proteins. What about chimeras where we actually couple the two together, taking advantage of the best of DNA structures and the best of protein structures? Um, and then moving on to, say, the next class of biomolecules. So rather than lipids, carbohydrates, DNA, and proteins, why can't we as chemists come up with molecules that are clearly based on monomer units, but that self-assemble into uh, more complex architectures based on the same principles that biology uses, with which is supermolecular chemistry, um, to tap into a whole new class of biomolecules with new structures and new functions. And then really, I would, I would argue that it's whatever your imagination um, allows is what we can, we can do with protein um, structure and protein function. So I was very conscious of, I think I may be way over time, so apologies if that's the case. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be delighted to answer any questions if there are any.